better now that you have coffee? I understand and I sympathize. <laughs> Um, I don't know if anybody caught the new Gilmore Girls over the weekend, but it got me like reinvigorated for just to drink all the coffee that exists. <laughs> so my name is Melody Chris Bowden, and I work for an organization called Peace Over Violence. And Peace Over Violence is an organization that's dedicating, dedicated to building a world free from sexual, domestic, and interpersonal violence. And I just wanted to start off by asking, how many of you attended this conference last year? Okay, so about half of the room. So for, uh, for those of you who are returning, uh, welcome back. Uh, you get to hear this presentation a second time because this is actually a similar one to what I did last year. But actually when we're talking about violence prevention, we talk about a strategy called dosage, which means it's actually really important to hear the same message a couple of times for it to really sink in. So I hope, uh, even if this is your second time hearing this presentation, that hopefully you learned some new things or maybe um, had a chance to pay attention to whether or not you've noticed any of these things over the last year. And to those of you who this is your first time being here, welcome. I'm really happy to be here talking to all of you to get to talk about this issue. Um, and I didn't get to talk to any of the high schoolers last year, so I'm really excited to see some of you here today. Um, and what I wanted to talk about today is I wanted to look at unhealthy relationships. So I know a lot of what we've been talking about today is kind of general cybercrime, general harassment that can happen using media, uh, whether that is maybe fear of a stranger, fear of people who we might interact with online. Uh, there might be fear of getting caught up with the wrong people. Uh, based on our online interactions, we might be thinking about bullying, as cyberbullying happens on campus. But what I really wanted to look at today is how does cyber abuse or how can technology play a role in relationships that students are in? So if we're actually looking at when they're dating or when they're in romantic relationships, what might be the role that uh, technology uh, or being online or social media might play on young people? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take us a little bit into just understanding what do abusive relationships look like or what do unhealthy relationships look like and then really focus in on cyber abuse and look at how, what is the role that technology might play. Uh, so I know that's kind of a lot and uh, it can actually be sometimes uh, a little difficult when we have adults and young people in the same room, especially if you uh, might be at the same schools. Uh, sometimes there are things that the students don't always want to talk about, sometimes uh, there might be fear, but what I want to say is hopefully we can take advantage of the fact that we are getting some cross-generational dialogue hopefully happening in the room, um, and hopefully that will help us out. So just a little bit about uh, Peace Over Violence and what we do. As I mentioned, we are a domestic violence and sexual assault agency. We've been serving uh, the Los Angeles community since 1971. We're the oldest domestic violence and sexual assault center on the West Coast. And as we developed over the last 45 years, we realized that we couldn't just be doing intervention and emergency services for people. So while we do offer 24-hour, around-the-clock crisis uh, services for people, whether that's going to the hospitals, if they are at a hospital because of a sexual assault or domestic violence, whether that is showing up at police stations or working our 24-hour hotline, these are all services that we provide to the community free of charge. We provide one-on-one -on -one counseling for free for people, art therapy, group therapy, support groups, case management, legal advocacy, whatever it is a person might need. And these, all of these services are available for anybody of any age. So you can always refer yourselves or other people to Peace Over Violence. But we also have uh, education, policy, and prevention. Uh, and I'm the manager of that department at Peace Over Violence. So what I spend a great deal of my job doing is working with institutions and working with school systems to try and help schools put in place protocols, procedures, uh, rules that are gonna help keep students safe if and when they might be uh, impacted by violence in their lives. So we're really looking at education, like how to build healthy relationships, education around anger management, healthy communication, 
um, looking at bystander intervention, understanding what consent is, any of these different things that might be involved in helping students learn how to build healthy relationships. And then I work, with, as I said, with teachers and the institutions themselves to try and ensure that there are protocols and practices in place so that students are kept safe and so that hopefully prevention and supportive services become ingrained into school culture. So I have uh, lots of time after this if people want to talk to me and have any questions about different services we can provide at schools. We provide uh, in the classroom education for students, as I mentioned, training for counselors, staff, work with you on your policies, anything like this. So I'm happy to talk to everybody about how your schools might get involved. And at Peace Over Violence, what we really believe is that violence is preventable and that it's something that people can unlearn. And so that's kind of what I'm hoping we can do today, is identify some strategies to prevent violence from occurring and uh, learn some of those warning signs so we can help students. So at Peace Over Violence, we define violence pretty broadly. So we, we uh, define violence as any act, action, force, or energy that injures, harms, or destroys. So I'm just gonna ask, does anything stand out to you about this definition of violence that I'm providing up here? Anything at all about it? Does it look correct? Does it look incorrect? Yes? Does it have a human? Okay, doesn't have a human. Any, any other thoughts about it? Okay, it's very generalized. Anything else? Okay, so yeah, I have violence up there in red, right? That's kind of like uh, imagery showing uh, the word, right? So, okay, yeah, what do you think? It doesn't say anything about bodily injury. Okay, it doesn't say anything about bodily injury. So everything that people have pointed out, I think is definitely accurate about this definition, and it was purposely written this way. So we define violence as any act, action, force, or energy that injures, harms, or destroys. So does that mean that um, a community shooting, would that fit into this definition as a type of violence? Yeah, right, that's pretty obvious. That might be one of those first examples of violence that we might think of if I ask you about this word. Uh, what about posting uh, a nude picture without someone's consent online? Would that fit into our definition of violence? Yeah. But it doesn't say anything about bodily harm up there. Doesn't violence have to be bodily harm? No, right? According to this definition, any act, action, force, or energy, right? So even the act of putting up the nude online without someone's consent, is that possibly causing injury, harm, or destruction? Yeah, yeah right? So according to our definition, that would be a type of violence. Now, can someone tell me why you think we have our definition of violence so broad. <coughs> Why do you think it's so general? Why isn't there anything about bodily harm? Yeah? Because the internet isn't physical. Okay, right, so the internet isn't physical. Does that mean that the internet can't be used to cause violence? No, right? So there are lots of things that cause violence. So part of why we have this definition is because there are a lot of things that happen that can be considered violence. Right? Even if it's just how I might make a facial expression at a person, or based on the words that I use, right? based on my attitudes. So that's why we have this definition so broad, is because we're really trying to show lots of things can be considered violence, right? And that we all have a choice in using violence or not use, using violence, right? We all have the ability to use violence, to cause destruction but we all have the ability not to do it as well. And I say that because I think for one, it can be empowering, right, to think I have the ability to not choose violence, right? But I also think what it does is it puts accountability on us. That if we understand that violence is a choice, it means that when we use it, we're actively making that choice to use violence. So again, part of what I do in prevention is trying to get people to not want to use violence as that first choice. So uh, before I move on, I want to ask, when I say something like domestic violence or dating violence or unhealthy relationships or abusive relationships, 
What kind of ideas come to your mind? What are things that you picture or think of? Okay, you think of Chris Brown. Why do you think of Chris Brown? Okay, Rihanna. Why do you think of Rihanna? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm pushing because maybe some of the adults don't know. <laughs> okay, so Chris Brown and Rihanna are both entertainers and were both in the news a few years ago for uh, dating violence or domestic violence coming up. So we uh, saw photos that were released of a Rihanna who looked like she had been beaten up and she said that this had happened over the course of her relationship. Okay, what are some other things that you might think of if you think of an abusive relationship or an unhealthy relationship? Okay, for the older audience, being considerate, Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown, right? So those are some things that we've heard of also. So we're thinking a lot about, I think, physical violence. We're thinking a lot about control. Are there any other things that might be going on in abusive relationships? What do you think? Okay, belittling, right? So put downs, name calling, right? Things like emotional abuse. So let me ask a question. Do we think it's possible for young people to experience unhealthy relationships. Yes. yes. Okay, all right, sounded pretty unanimous up here. How do you think unhealthy relationships might look within the context of teenagers' relationships? What are some things, so I heard just about everybody in the room go, yes, yes, yes. So tell me, how do you know? How do you know that there are relationships that are unhealthy? Yes. Um, through manipulation, coercion, um, well, I love you, so. Sorry, it's not going to happen again. Or even, you know, I, I have this picture of you, you better not break up with me. Or okay, so I heard a lot of things in there. I heard manipulation, I heard coercion, I heard threats, I heard uh, having a picture and using that against the other person for a blackmail. Yes, what else? I think anyone trying to dominate or control behaviors, actions, attitudes, beliefs. Else. Okay, great. So when in the relationship there might be one person who's trying to dominate, trying to control, trying to take over that relationship. Absolutely. That's a really, really great example. And it fits my definition pretty perfectly. Uh, so let me see. Can I get, just for the sake of it, why not? I spend a lot of time in the classroom if you can't tell. Can I get somebody to read this definition? of relationship violence for me. Can I get a volunteer to read that out loud? Anyway. <laughs> Go for it. We define relationship violence as a pattern of behavior where one person uses intimidation, threats, or actual physical, <coughs> emotional, or sexual violence in order to maintain power and control over their partner. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, so exactly what uh, was said earlier, this idea is that there's an imbalance of power and control, right? So when we're thinking about unhealthy relationships, it's not just the actions that one or both uh, participants might be showing, but it's really about this attitude of domination and this attitude of inequality, that one person gets to control the relationship. And when we use a term like teen dating violence, which is a term I use pretty often at work, all we're talking about is relationship violence where one or both partners are teenagers, right? So this definition I have up at the top, that would be the definition for domestic violence or dating violence, regardless of the age. So if we're thinking about adults, we're talking about a couple who is married, that same definition would apply. So teen dating violence or adolescent relationship abuse, when we're talking about it, it's the same thing. It's just that one or both people happen to be under the age of 18. So that's what we're thinking a little bit about today. So why do I want to talk about this, right? That's, that's one of the questions that I can sometimes get is, why are we even talking about dating violence? Why are we talking about this in the context of people who work at schools? Why are we talking about this as it relates to young people? Well, part of why we're talking about it is that it actually happens, right? So we know that just about 1.5 million high school students nationwide experience some type of physical abuse uh, by the person who they're dating within one year, right? That's, pretty, that's a pretty high number probably a little bit higher than you would have thought, right? I know it was definitely higher than I thought when I originally learned about this, right? That one in three adolescents 
is the victim of some sort of abuse from a dating partner. One in three is actually the same statistic that we give for adult women experiencing some form of dating violence in their life as well. So again, a very high number, right? And that one in 10 high school students has been purposely hit by their partner, right? So uh, different numbers, but all telling the same kind of story, right? Painting a really similar picture that unfortunately what we're seeing is that our young people are experiencing unhealthy behaviors and violence in some of their relationships. Any questions or just kind of initial thoughts or reactions to any of these numbers or statistics? Yes? Has that increased? Uh, so this has remained pretty uh, solid over the last few years. We haven't really seen too big of an increase or a decrease. Um, and if people are interested where some of this information is coming from, it's coming from the YRBS, so the Youth Risk Behavior Survey that's given out every other year. Yes? That's, a, that's also a really great question. So in terms of race, I don't have any sort of information as to a, a, a background in that. And this is mostly across gender. So we do see that there tends to be a more equality across genders when we're looking at unhealthy teen relationships. So boys and girls tend to experience uh, abuse and perpetration at kind of similar rates. Any, any other reactions, questions, anything like that based on this information? Yes? Yeah, just to follow up on the first question. Sure. Has there been a trend where this has increased with the advent of uh, social media? Yes, so what we have seen is increases in the amount of cyber abuse. So that's what we're actually going to spend some time looking at, is specifically the rates of how technology plays into this. So uh, just, uh, just really quickly, I did want to just review what some of the different types of abuse are that might be experienced within some of these relationships. So you're probably pretty familiar with these, but I would like to go through and maybe do a couple of examples. So can anybody tell me how you think physical abuse might show up within the context of a teenage relationship? Do you think it's any similar or different from how we might see it uh, compared to an adult relationship. Yes? I think for physical, uh, for tests, um, it may be a little different in the sense that um, they might not even realize that they're doing it, by uh, you know, the boyfriend or girlfriend says or does something that the other doesn't like and then hits them, uh, you know, especially in front of their friends, classmates, um, and they don't realize that, that that's a form of an Okay, that's a really great example, right? So uh, those kinds of physical exchanges that maybe don't seem as serious at the beginning, right? So something like play fighting, right? I know that that's something that I used to see a lot in high school and that I still see a lot of these days is that there's this play fighting that can happen, um, but probably to some of us as adults, we're looking at this and thinking, but that's not a really healthy way to be interacting with your partner, right? Uh, any other thoughts about how physical abuse might happen within the context of a teen relationship. So I have a question for you, uh, for the adults in the room. If one of your students walked into your class one day and had a black eye, what's your reaction? What happened? Mandated reporting, calling a parent, finding out with administration what to do, right? So how do you think physical abuse might be taking place within, well, uh, hold on, let me ask another question. Young people in the room, do you know what happens if you show up to the classroom with a black eye? You could, you could kind of conceal it, yeah. Do you have to hide it? Do, would you feel like you have to hide it? Yeah, why? Because you know that they're gonna ask a question, right? So young people know that adults are gonna ask a question if they walk in with a black eye. So I saw a hand somewhere. No, maybe, okay. So what we tend to see within these, these relationships is also the fact that physical abuse is a lot of times hidden in places where probably clothing can cover it up, right? So it's not gonna be as obvious that it's happening, right? That's one kind of thing to pay attention to. Um, 
verbal abuse, I think we probably have a pretty good understanding of this, right? Some people have already given examples of like belittling, manipulating, these kinds of things. What about se can sexual abuse happen within the context of young people's relationships? Yeah, right? So uh, I have a feeling the adults know, but I'll just kind of ask the room in general. Uh, can someone's partner force them to do something sexual that they don't want to do? And would that be considered sexual assault? Yes. Okay, good. Happy to hear that everybody knows that. So even within your relationships, you have the right to say no. You have the right to not do something just because your partner is telling you. But unfortunately, not all young people know that. Right? They don't know that they can say no to their partner. They don't know that they don't have to do everything that their partner says. And a lot of times we see youth using this, um, and sometimes like really into like, so they'll pray, and I mean that in as non-malicious as a way as possible, but they'll kind of prey on the idea that, uh, you know, maybe the girls don't know that much about uh, reproductive health or sexual health, right? So for, what I'm trying to get at is like, so we've seen like middle schoolers, right? Using that whole like, um, I'm gonna get cancer if you don't, you know, help me out, right? I'm gonna get cancer if you don't touch me here, right? Those kinds of things. And what I mean by that is a lot of times we're not really having conversations with young people about, and all the kids are laughing, right? I know, it's really funny. But, but remember in middle school when maybe you didn't know the answers to like what was happening with your body, right? And sometimes what we've seen is those students who do understand their bodies or maybe who spend a lot of time online using that education or using that knowledge to manipulate the person that they're with, right? So we, we do see some of these ha things happening as well. Um, emotional or mental abuse, right? We talked about coercion, we talked about taking power. And now I wanna kind of get into some of the cyber and digital stuff. And I would love to hear any ideas or examples or anything that anybody might think. What, what could be the role that teenagers' phones, computers, social media profiles, whatever it might be, how might this impact their relationship? What do you think is the role that social media could play or technology could play? Okay, so maybe in general, wanting to control who my partner follows on their social media, right? So maybe I, can, I want to control who my boyfriend or girlfriend can or can't follow on Snapchat, right? I know that's a pretty popular one, right? That people are really looking to try and control who their partner is looking at or are friends with. What else, or any other ideas of what you think technology, uh, the role that technology might play? Yeah? This is, this is kind of using technology to follow to some of the other categories, sure. but uh, I have a uh, high school age daughter who has been asked by multiple different boys to send <coughs> Okay. And, you know, because of this conference we're talking about in the last five years, of course, she's smart enough to say, why would I do that? Mm -hmm. um, for, for all the reasons that I like that, too. But if you're asking her, and these are random guys. There's guys that have asked her out. There are guys who just want to ask her out or whatever. Um, but you know that they're doing it to a variety of other people. For a variety of reasons. Of sure. And so she said to me, she says, even if this guy liked me and I felt prone to doing that, someday we're going to break up. And I don't know what he's going to do with those people. Okay. So that's a really great example. And thank you for sharing that, right? So this idea that technology can be used to perhaps solicit photos or even other types of information, right, um, to later perhaps be used as some sort of threat or blackmail, right? And that's something that a lot of students um, are hopefully considering when they're deciding whether or not to send these types of photos, right? But so absolutely, we can see in relationships where someone might use the threat of sharing a photo with someone else to try and control their partner. So these are all really great examples. So just to, uh, to look a little bit more closely at this, so when we're thinking about cyber abuse and how it uh, impacts dating relationships, 
we're really looking at psychologically abusive behaviors that are perpetrated by romantic partners via technology or new media. So what I think is interesting about this is kind of what, like what was just shared. It's not only about how can that social media or technology be used, but how can that social media and technology be used in combination with mental abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, or any of these other types of abuse that might be happening. There's a lot of overlap, and we don't ever really just see one type of abuse happening within the context of a relationship. So uh, I want to hear maybe from a couple of the other young people. Uh, how, how have you seen social media used, whether it's in a relationship or not, um, and maybe you're just making it up, maybe you've seen this on TV, maybe you haven't seen it yourselves, but how is social be media being used uh, to hurt other people? Is it being used to hurt other people or try and get people to do what they want or what do you think? Any thoughts about it? Okay, nudes leaking, I'm hearing a trend. So Snapchat, I've heard a lot used uh, to make different kinds of threats because uh, it does disappear after a few moments and they're, uh, you know, the young people feel like those kinds of things can't be uh, checked on later, right? So there's different ways that social media uh, and cyber abuse can be used. Um, what is another example of something? Oh, this, so this was one that actually like really hurt my feelings. I just felt like, oh my God, I couldn't, if someone did this to me, it would totally mess me up. Um, but so back in the day when a lot of people used to use Facebook, um, I heard a story about somebody tagging their girlfriend in a picture of them, like kissing somebody else. And that was their way of telling their girlfriend that they were breaking up with them, was by tagging them in that picture so that they could see it, right? So there's a lot of uh, creative ways that people have found to use social media uh, to really kind of hurt one another. So, so I think this is an important question to ask, right? So you're, you're hearing a lot today about different types of cyber abuse, and you're probably hearing some repetitive information, right, about how social media can be used. But why do you think I'm even kind of talking about it in the relationship to being in a couple, right? Or being romantic with somebody else. How do you think cyber abuse might look different when it's within a relationship as opposed to general bullying or harassment that goes on? What do you think? Well, I think in a relationship there's an element of trust. Mm -hmm. that you each think you can trust each other. A former student I had was in a relationship with a guy and they were dating and they loved each other. But then when they broke up, what she had sent him as a Snapchat, it was actually a provocative picture, that she thought disappeared, he screenshot, and then it went everywhere. Right. They broke up. Right, okay, so that's a really wonderful example, and thank you for highlighting that. So one reason why I like to uh, add to the conversation this idea about <coughs> cyber abuse, how it might be used within relationships, is because of that element of trust. Right? So I might know I'm not supposed to send a nude to a stranger. I might know I'm not supposed to post a nude somewhere where anybody can get access to it. But what if this is my boyfriend or girlfriend? Why wouldn't I just send it to them? Why isn't that okay? Right? So there's that extra added level of that issue of trust, right? That when we're talking to our students or our children, we really have to uh, take an extra moment, I think, to kind of walk through why might even sending something like this to someone who we trust be something we want to think twice about. Any other ideas about why this might look different? Yes, what do you think? Well, you mentioned earlier about this balance of power in a relationship. Okay. How that you know, might be as well. Sure, absolutely, right? So it's really about a power dynamic <coughs> happening within the relationship. Yes. It would be, so the relationship would be more subtle, where it's just generic cyberbullying. It would be really obvious. But maybe the boyfriend just types, puts a note on his girlfriend's wall. Nobody knows anybody, really. But that was an argument they had the day before, and he's like poking his finger at her. 
Okay, I, I really, really like that example as well, right? It may not be as obvious that it's happening, right? It may not be obvious to us as outsiders, perhaps looking in as adults, perhaps as friends, seeing a post and thinking that it is uh, innocuous, but really it is uh, based off of something else, right? But also, what about for the young person experiencing right, it, right? It might be that they may not realize that what is happening is abusive because this is the person who they're in a relationship with. Versus if this were a stranger or someone who they identified as a bully, they might automatically register something is not okay with it. So what else do you think? Uh, just going back to the fact that these are teenagers, mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many like, hormones going mm -hmm. on and this is the first time, maybe like a first relationship or one of the first relationships. And so they may idolize this person and see them as this is the end all be all. I'm going to invest myself totally into this and I'm going to try to make this work. And so, because of that, they just, they are going to find people in a vicious cycle. Absolutely, right? So, if we're thinking about perhaps this is only the first or second relationship that this young person has been in, and they may not know that this type of behavior and these types of actions are not healthy to happen in a relationship, right? I know uh, one of the biggest, uh, I'll say, heated discussions that I have with young people is about the idea of looking at their partner's phones, right? And this idea that checking their partner's phones, looking at their text messages, looking who they're talking to, is not a healthy part of a relationship, right? And a lot of young people don't understand that concept, right? Because, well, that's what my friends do in their relationships. Or maybe even that's what my parents do in their relationships, right? So if this is how they're experiencing their first relationships, and we as the adults around them are not taking that time to explain to them what healthy relationships look like, we could be starting something that might end up a pattern for the rest of their lives, right? Yes, what else do you think? Well, I think the focus of this discussion has been on, um, uh, you know, a relationship with a partner, but uh -huh. I think a lot of abuse can occur in a friendship Absolutely. as well. And that those can be unhealthy relationships, and those can be places where a lot of hurt and abuse takes place. Absolutely, and I thank you for bringing that up, because I think a lot of what we're talking about can also apply to friend relationships, right? This idea of trust, this idea of maybe not recognizing when people who we think love us or who we love are treating us unfairly or abusively and we don't pay attention to it. So whether we're thinking about a romantic partner, a dating partner, or a friend, I think all of these different things can apply, right? Um, and I'll just say, uh, to even get us to push and think another step further, think about a student or a young person asking for help, right? When do you think a young person is, might be more likely to ask for help? If the person who is hurting them is a random bully, or when the person is someone who they love and care about, right? So when we're thinking about even how young people might be experiencing these things and asking for help or not asking for help, or reaching out and talking to an adult or not reaching out and talking to an adult, Right, think about the, uh, you know, we see this happening a lot of times in like books and movies and things like that. Step, standing up or doing something to hurt our friend or something that we might see as hurting our friend or someone we love can be a lot harder, right? So sure, if another random student posted something mean about me online, it might be fairly easy for me to go and let somebody know and ask for help, right? Because I don't want connection with that student. I don't want the student to pay attention to me. I don't want them to say anything bad about me, but I don't care if they say anything nice to me. I just want it to stop. I don't want to interact with that person, right? If it's a friend or if it's a dating partner, what do you think young people might be feeling about those interactions? Why might it be so hard for students to reach out for help if it's a dating partner or a friend who might be using social media to bully them or to cause violence or control them. 
Why might that be difficult? Yes. Okay, so I might be afraid that my parents might make a big deal out of it, right? Um, I don't know about any of the young people in the room. I was not allowed to date when I was growing up. Guess what? No, but I dated in high school, right? <laughs> I was not allowed to date, but I dated in high school. Nobody tell my mom, by the way. Uh, but I dated in high school, right? If I had been on the receiving end of technological abuse, knowing that I was not allowed to date, how might I have felt in that situation? I'll tell you that I would not have asked my mom for help. I will definitely tell you that. Because I was much more afraid of getting in trouble for dating than for whatever was happening with me in a relationship, right? So that that can be part of it, right? Um, so so, and I, and I'll go back to why don't students report these kinds of things. But but like I said, I did want us to just take that minute to think about why are you even here in this workshop when you've had all of the other ones? Because there are some extra complications. I think when we're thinking about how to intervene with students and how to really support them through these kinds. Uh, so this is also just a little bit of like dating abuse 101, but something that I just wanted to point out was this idea of this cycle of violence. So when we're thinking about how violence happens and how violence occurs within abusive relationships, it actually follows this three-pronged pattern, right? So what we generally see is that there's a honeymoon stage, and probably most of us in this room can relate to that, right? This idea at uh, the beginning of the relationship, everything is really wonderful, you are just doing things to try and impress that person, everything is like really happy, hearts and butterflies and all that stuff. I always kind of say like, it's before you let that other person see you without makeup, right? All of those different things. Um, but when it's in an abusive relationship or an unhealthy relationship and we see tension start to grow, right? Because it's not a balanced relationship, that tension can evolve into abuse, right? To where it manifests and it really gets so acute, all of that tension, that there's an explosion of abuse. Whether that is mental, verbal, cyber, physical, sexual, it's just a, all of that tension becoming to be too much and that person with the more power needing to assert their power within that relationship and show dominance, right? But we see it followed by a honeymoon stage, right? And what do you think a honeymoon stage might look like after perhaps some sort of abuse or verbal outburst has happened? What do you think honeymoon stage looks like now? Yeah. Yeah, right? It's an apology. It might be buying gifts. It might be taking them out on a date, right? This is a really confusing experience to go through, right? of being within a relationship where one day one person might be controlling, might be dominant, might be coercive, to the next day when they're trying to be nice, they're trying to buy gifts, right? Doing what they need to for you to stay in these relationships. So again, to think about how this might be impacting a 15, a 16, a 17 year old, right? When there's already confusion confusion where there's already maybe not an understanding of what a healthy relationship looks like, once we start seeing this cycle start to form and start to take place, it can be really, really difficult to break out of it. So what I have up here, it's a lot of text, right? And I know it can be kind of overwhelming, but I did want to put these up here. And I'm uh, wondering if maybe we can do just like two or three minutes or a couple minutes of conversations at our table. Um, but what these are from, this is from a survey that was done in the Northeast uh, about, in about 2012, 2011, 2012. It was done across about 10 middle schools and high schools. And they asked students specifically to list out what types of technological or cyber abuse had they experienced. And these are the answers, uh, not in any particular order, 
I think I just randomly put them up here. But I would like if you could take a few minutes, and I'd like you to discuss at your tables which one of these uh, are really sticking out to you, right? Which one of these are you surprised about? Which ones have maybe you all seen? So let's do this. So let's have at every table, why don't you think about which ones have, are ones that you have seen, perhaps? Have you seen or heard about any of these things happening? And then let's also do which one are you most surprised about?
but also this idea of like why we even have to have conferences like today is that we didn't experience this growing up, right? So it takes, I mean, I don't know about for you, but even before I started doing this work, some of these things may not have been obvious to me. And even sometimes to this day, I have to remind myself to find out what this technological situation is between a couple that I'm talking to, right? Just looking at name calling and physical abuse and control and all that isn't enough, isn't enough these days. And then, yes, another hand. that maybe wouldn't have if social media or this technology were not available for some of that anonymity or distance to be made. Absolutely, yes. Um, going back to what this gentleman said about sharing passwords or yeah. other people who know your passwords, um, there was a professor at UCLA that I spoke with probably about five years ago, and he told me in his research that he found that there's a distinct at least five years ago, there was a distinct line between people over 35 and people younger than 35. I'm sorry to the kids in the room. Where the over 35 were very careful about privacy and privacy issues and worrying about what data they put online and how it got disseminated and used. Whereas the <coughs> generation had zero sense of privacy or zero expectation of privacy. So I think that does lead a lot to this whole issue sure. sharing, you know, allowing someone else to go to your social media account and use it and catfish and so on. Absolutely right. And I think that, oh, thank you. I think this brings up a lot of different things, right? Especially when we're thinking as teachers, as parents, as administrators, when talking to students is, you know, this idea around privacy and passwords and all of that. You know, in a relationship, two people can decide how they want to deal with passwords and privacy and all of those different things, right? But I think what I really point out to, whether it's the young people who I'm working with or the adults, is what is the expectation, though? Is there an expectation that I must share my password with my partner? Is there an expectation that I have to let them see who I'm talking to? who I'm interacting with, and are they using that to try and control me, right? Or are they using that as a threat? Are they using that to cause abuse through the relationship? So um, one thing that I also wanted to point out here is that a few of these different examples up here have little stars next to them, have asterisks next to them. Can anybody identify, perhaps, what, what might be a common theme throughout some of these examples that have the asterisks next to them. Okay, so yeah, so they all cross from not just being cyber or technological abuse, but to also being forms of sexual abuse. 
right? And that's one of the things, because I am getting towards the end of my time, but one of the things that I wanted to highlight, again, of why are you even sitting here talking about abusive relationships at a cyber crime symposium, is because not only do we see cyber crime happening in relationships, but we see that there is a fairly large overlap between cyber abuse happening and other forms of abuse happening. So on that last slide where I showed you all of the examples of responses that students gave as to types of cyber abuse that they had either experienced or seen perpetrated, from those same students who answered, 84% of them who were experiencing cyber abuse were also experiencing mental or emotional abuse in their relationship. 52% were also experiencing physical violence in their relationship. And 33% were also experiencing physical abuse. So part of what I also hope that you walk away with from today is not just taking the extra step to think about how cyber abuse might be playing into an unhealthy relationship or talking to students about the role that technology might play in their relationships, but it's also to perhaps look at cyber abuse as a warning sign that there might be other things happening in that relationship. Because all that you might see or all that you might hear about is the post that went up or the rumor that was spread or about the password that was taken. But again, what we see is that when there is cyber abuse, there's a pretty high likelihood that there are other types of abuse happening within the relationship. Right? So I wanted to help, I, I want to help support you to be able to recognize some of these things, but also recognize how it plays into other situations. Yes? We were talking a lot about passwords, but there's so much competition with my students, how many followers they have, mm -hmm. how many friends they have. And they'll say, but I don't give out my password. Right. And I tell them, the minute you friend someone or you have them as a follower, you've basically done the same Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. You've given them access. Absolutely, and that's the same thing with you with a partner uh, or anybody else who might be there. Right? So I, we talked about this a little bit and we're just about running out of time, so I, I'm not going to take this up for you, but again, I do, I would like if you could take a minute or two uh, or maybe some time later on to think, so why, why might students have a hard time reporting teen dating violence that they're experiencing, whether it's cyber abuse uh, combined with other types or whatever it might be, if a student is in an unhealthy relationship, why might they have a hard time talking to you about it? Whether that's as their parent or again as their teacher or counselor, and then think about what is the role that you can play? What can you do not only as a parent, but also if you are at a school, what is the role that a school can play in helping to prevent unhealthy relationships from happening? So I just want to leave a couple of resources up here for you. These all three phone numbers go to the same hotline. We just have different area codes to make it easier for people, but it is completely free, completely anonymous for people to call. It's a 24-hour hotline. And these are just some online resources that you can go to. Uh, the top one is just Peace Over Violence's website if you want to find out how to connect with me, how to connect with the organization. And the bottom two, Love is Respect, and That's Not Cool, our uh, website specifically for teens and for adults uh, to understand and get resources for teen dating violence specifically. So they have a, uh, they actually have a hotline, a chat line, where students can text and chat with somebody if they need it. They give you resources as parents, resources as educators on how to talk about these issues with students. Um, and again, if anybody needs me, my name is Melody. I'll be around for the rest of the day. Thank you for having me today and enjoy your day.
15, 18 years of normalization is a slow process. Um, so be patient with yourselves. But I think one of the strategies that we use um, is for one, just pointing out things that are not normal um, and helping students to understand why they might not be normal. So, uh, you know, blackmailing someone with a picture, talking through with them why that's not okay. Um, and then what I really like to do is to try and normalize healthy behaviors. So I try to make it normal for uh, like effective communication to be the go-to strategy. I try and make it normal for empathy to be something that they identify with. I try and make it normal to call out people or call in people who might be posting other things. So I think um, it's pointing out what's normal, but sometimes I think even more important is replacing it with the behaviors that you would rather see. That's kind of where I've seen the most success. Okay, well I'm around if you need anything. Thank you everyone.